Greetings, this is Bjorn Hansen, Divisional Dean of the New York University Preston Robertish Center for Hospitality, Tourism, and Sports Management. Welcome to another in our series of podcasts presented by the faculty of the Tisch Center. These podcasts are one of the many programs to support our mission of industry-based education in three of the most exciting fields of study, hospitality, tourism, and sports management. Each of our last four podcasts has been accessed by over 1,000 attendees. We are grateful for the interest and support. The subject of today's podcast is Quality Starts in Baseball, an in-depth look at redefining its relevance, a two-part presentation. Each of the presentations is less than a half hour. Our faculty presenter today is a recognized academic and scholar in the subject of the business of baseball, Associate Professor Wayne McDonald. I am pleased to introduce Professor Wayne McDonald. Thank you, Dean Hansen, for the warm introduction. On a Tuesday evening in the summer of 1963, 15,921 fans bustled through the turnstiles at Candlestick Park, eagerly awaiting a pitching matchup that featured two men who would forever be enshrined in baseball's pantheon of pitching excellence. One man was nearing the end of a storied career that spanned over two decades and 363 victories, the other was about to embark on a string of four consecutive 21 seasons where he would amass an astonishing 93-35 and 35 record with a 2.31 earned run average. While Warren Spahn and Juan Marichal's pitching legacies are firmly cemented in baseball's record books, it is their participation in a 16-inning game that represents several anomalies and romantically defines an extinct era of baseball. Not only did both men pitch complete games in the 1-0 victory by the San Francisco Giants, but they combined to throw 428 pitches. According to Bill Madden, Marichal threw 227 pitches, and the elder statesman Spahn threw 201. What made the feat even more impressive was the fact that Spahn was 42 years old. As a major league pitcher for 21 years, Warren Spahn threw 382 complete games, and is the all-time career leader in victories for a left-handed pitcher. Spahn also won 20 more games 13 times over 21 seasons. To put it in perspective, Spahn completed 57.44% of the games that he had started during his Hall of Fame career. On average, Spahn made 31.67 starts and accumulated 18.19 complete games per season. Spahn's adversary on July 2nd, 1963, was also quite familiar with finishing bowl games. Juan Marichal had completed 53.39% of the games that he had started throughout his career, and in 1968, he had completed an astonishing 30 games. Over 16 seasons, Marichal had accumulated a 2.89 career earned run average while achieving a 631 winning percentage. Marichal would also have an unprecedented run of success between the 1963 and 1969 seasons, where he would win 20 or more games on six different occasions. In recent times, we have witnessed a significant decline in the number of complete games achieved by starting pitchers in both the American and National Leagues. During the 1960 to 2010 seasons, there were 29,555 complete games thrown by pitchers in Major League Baseball. However, only 5,114 of these complete games were pitched after the 1989 season. The following line chart, Complete Games 1960 to 2010, graphically shows the demise of complete games in both the American and National Leagues over the last five decades. During the 1960 to 1979 seasons, there were 18,092 complete games thrown between starting pitches in the American and National Leagues. The most prolific decade for complete games in the past 50 years was surprisingly the 1970s. Pitches such as Steve Carlton, Ferguson Jenkins, Gaylord Perry, and Phil Necro frequently led their respective leagues during an era when it was quite common for a starting pitcher to accumulate at least 20 complete games in a season. In total, 10,039 complete games 
were thrown throughout the 1970s. Due to the scarcity of complete games thrown by starting pitchers and an emphasis placed on pitch counts and innings limits, the quality start has the potential of becoming a significant statistic in the modern game. Now, let's take a moment to examine the origins of the quality start and to also define its relevance. But first, let's take a look at two quotes from Josh Beckett and Nolan Ryan that summarize the current frustrations regarding the antiquated definition of a quality start. Kurt Schilling said it best, six innings and three runs is a 4.5 earned run average. That is not a quality start, not from where I come from. Boston Red Sox pitcher, Josh Beckett. Our expectations have been lowered. There's no reason why kids today can't pitch as many innings as people did in my era. Today, a quality start is six innings. What's quality about that? Nolan Ryan, Hall of Fame pitcher and CEO and president of the Texas Rangers. An article written by John Lowe had appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer on December 26, 1985, and it dramatically changed our perceptions as to how we should view and evaluate starting pitchers. Lowe had created the quality start statistic as a way to identify consistency and durability in starting pitches that were not being captured by wins and losses. According to Lowe, a pitcher gets credit for a quality start anytime he allows three earned runs or less in a start that last at least six innings. Lowe also observed the foremost attribute of this statistic is that it shows exactly how many times a man has done exactly what his job is, pitch well enough for his team to have a chance to win. Lowe's new statistic had captured an unexpected trend that had begun to permeate throughout baseball. Starting pitches were no longer required to throw complete games and a heavy dependence upon the bullpen became prevalent. Lowe observed, in this bullpen era, a starter's job is not to throw a complete game. It is not even necessarily to win the game. It is to make a quality start, to give his team a decent chance to win. The driving principle behind the quality start statistic can be summarized by a single question. Did a starting pitcher put his ball club in a favorable position to win after completing only two-thirds of a ball game? Even though the quality start statistic didn't come into vogue until 1986, BaseballReference.com has done an exemplary job and has applied the statistic to pitchers of previous generations. The following line chart, quality starts 1960 to 2010, applies the traditional definition of a quality start to five decades worth of pitching performances by comparing the American and National Leagues. The numbers highlighted in yellow represent the high points and quality starts in each decade for both the American and National Leagues. Lately, we have seen starting pitches struggle to accumulate double-digit complete games due to an array of reasons stemming from conditioning, pitch counts, player matchups, and a heavy dependency on the bullpen. In some cases, relievers and closers are paid even more than starting pitchers. Also, we cannot overlook the evolution of free agency, player development strategies, incentive clauses and contracts, and advancements in training, orthopedic surgery, and physical therapy. We marvel in amazement at the endurance and durability of modern day pitchers, such as Roy Halladay and CC Sabathia. We applaud their work ethic and unbridled enthusiasm to pitch deep into ball games. However, Sabathia has only achieved double figures and complete games once, and that was in 2008, and Halliday has yet to achieve this feat even though he has had three consecutive seasons of nine complete games. Sabathia has accumulated 30 complete games over a 10-year period, 2001 to 2010, while Halliday has achieved 58 complete games over 13 years, 1998 to 2010. 
Major League Baseball hasn't seen a pitcher reach double digits in complete games since 1999 when Randy Johnson pitched 12 complete games en route to his first of four consecutive Cy Young Awards with the Arizona Diamondbacks. In total, Johnson had won five Cy Young Awards. To put it in its proper perspective, Hall of Fame pitcher Tom Seaver had pitched 90 complete games by the end of his fifth season in 1971. Over the first 10 seasons of his career, Seaver had averaged 16.1 complete games per season. In an article written by ESPN the magazine's Tim Kirchin entitled Baseball's Magic Number 100, San Diego Padres manager Bud Black confirmed for the readers what many have thought for some time. Starting pitchers today are conditioned for only 100 pitches. The philosophy of pitching until a pitcher is ineffective has become obsolete even when today's athletes are far more physically gifted than athletes from previous generations. The management philosophies of today's baseball franchises has somehow impeded the growth and progress of gifted athletes. Now, let's spend a few moments talking about Little League Baseball. The prevalence of pitch counts has not only occurred on the major league level. Little League Baseball has taken a proactive approach to potential elbow and shoulder problems in young ball players by implementing pitch count requirements beginning at 7 years old and going all the way up to 18 years old. They have also incorporated rules regarding rest periods after a young athlete has completed the strenuous exercise of pitching. Now, let's spend a moment looking at high school baseball. New York City's Public Schools Athletic League has recently adopted specific guidelines that will protect the arms of high school pitchers. In an article written by Harvey Arriton in the New York Times, he discussed how two city councilmen pressured New York City's Public Schools Athletic League to adopt maximum pitch counts and required rest periods. According to Arriton, Councilman Louis A. Fiddler of Brooklyn and G. Oliver Coppell of the Bronx led the crusade to implement pitch counts for varsity and junior varsity ballplayers. As a result, a maximum limit of 105 pitches per game was implemented for varsity ballplayers and a 90-pitch limit was instituted for junior varsity ballplayers. In addition to the pitch limits per game, additional rules regarding the eligibility of ballplayers pitching on consecutive days and predetermined rest periods based on pitch counts have been implemented as well. The following chart clearly summarizes the public school's athletic league's pitch count limits and required rest periods. While pitch counts and required rest periods have rightfully become commonplace throughout various levels of Little League and high school baseball, some on the professional level are struggling with the overly cautious approach to pitch and innings limits. Some are of the belief that today's pitchers are being coddled and aren't allowed to reach their maximum potential as professional athletes. In an article written by Albert Chen of Sports Illustrated entitled Nolan Ryan's Crusade, the Hall of Fame pitcher has become an outspoken critic on the current state of affairs in baseball when it comes to pitching. Ryan has publicly challenged the mental and physical conditioning of pitchers today. He is of the belief that pitchers can't think for themselves since they have been controlled for so long by coaches in Little League, high school, and college. Instead of learning how to determine what pitches to throw by instinct or trial and error, Ryan believes that pitches have become too robotic in nature. They are too dependent upon coaches to make key decisions for them in critical times during the course of a game. Unfortunately, this has created a sense of complacency amongst pitchers. If there is anyone who can address issues pertaining to endurance and durability with today's pitchers, it's Nolan Ryan. 
Besides the instant credibility that he brings to the conversation, Ryan was notorious for possessing a fiercely competitive spirit plus an insatiable appetite for exercise and conditioning. As the all-time career leader in strikeouts, a member of the 300 Wing Club, and author of 7-0 Hitters, Nolan Ryan has become synonymous with statistical feats that are extraordinary in nature and almost impossible to emulate. While Ryan's strikeouts, victories, and no-hitters garner most of the public's attention, there are a handful of unheralded statistics that add to the mystique that surrounds Nolan Ryan. Ryan threw 250 or more innings in a season on six different occasions and even eclipsed 300 innings twice in 1973 and 1974. Thanks to BaseballReference.com's extensive database on pitch counts that officially dates back to 1988, we are able to study Nolan Ryan in ways that some might think were unimaginable. Unfortunately, only the last six years of Ryan's career coincided with the reporting of pitch counts. However, the small sample size still tells a compelling story of absolute amazement. At the age of 42, Ryan had thrown 100 or more pitches on 30 different occasions, plus his high mark in total pitches in an outing was 164. According to Chen, Ryan is on a personal mission to unshackle the modern day pitcher and to also redefine what a quality start actually is. However, Ryan is also well aware that many do not share his old school philosophies on pitching and that his unconventional tactics might not work with a generation of ball players who are not accustomed to an aggressive approach to pitching. The naysayers are quick to point out that today's lineups, especially in the American League, are far deeper and stronger than lineups that Ryan had faced in his prolific 27 year career. Also, the ever diminishing strike zone and smaller ballparks have served as a detriment to pitching statistics as well. While pitch counts have become a universally accepted practice, by no means are the Texas Rangers married to the conventional philosophies of the concept. Chen observes that Nolan Ryan's ball club lives by the mantra that all 100 pitch games are not created equal and that each game must be treated in a separate and distinct manner. Most importantly, each baseball game has a unique rhythm to it because some games are harder than others. Whether it pertains to the opponent, time of the day, weather, stadium, pitches overall health, or even the time of the season, each ball game should be treated separately. Chan observes that the Rangers adhere to the belief that some games are more stressful on a pitcher's arm than others. Also, the 100-pitch plateau should not be used as an indicator of distress for every ball game. As CEO and president of the Texas Rangers, Ryan has implemented a robust conditioning program in an attempt to build strength and endurance. According to Chen, Ryan has increased sprints and lower leg work on top of the pitchers throwing live batting practice to hitters beginning on the first day of spring training. These exercises help build arm strength and endurance. Also, the Texas Rangers had consulted with Alan Yeager, an independent pitching coach, to discuss long toss strategies. In the spring of 2009, the Texas Rangers made a decision to allow their pitchers to participate in long toss drills at distances between 225 and 300 feet. The normally accepted practice within baseball is 120 feet. In Jaeger's opinion, not only will these distances help build arm strength, but it is also a better correlation to the effort needed to throw a 90 mile per hour fastball off of a mound. One group of ball players who are perplexed with the state of pitching in today's game is the Hall of Famers. Jerry Krasnick of ESPN.com wrote an article entitled, Pitch Counts, Encouraging Mediocrity. In the article, Krasnick clearly identifies three pet peeves that have irritated the pitching immortals of the game. 
Start is looking toward the dugout at the first sign of trouble, looking to be bailed out. 12 to 13 pitchers being carried on the roster instead of the 10-man staff. And the praise and adulation that pitchers receive based on the current definition of a quality start. An outspoken critic of the quality start statistic is Don Sutton. Sutton, a 23-year veteran who won 324 games, has called the quality start statistic absurd and ridiculous, according to Krasny. It is also worth noting that Sutton never spent a day on the disabled list and made 30 or more starts in a season an astonishing 20 times to complement eight seasons in which he threw more than 250 innings. Krasnick observes that Sutton believes that the 100 pitch count is used as an unsubstantiated artificial limit that causes pitchers to feel fatigue based on a predetermined barrier set by others. As the Hall of Famers question the mediocrity overwhelming the game of baseball, they are also pondering the goals of pitch counts. If pitch counts are designed to monitor the health of a pitcher, why are so many pitchers developing serious elbow, arm, and labrum injuries? Krasnick observes that some Hall of Famers equate these health issues due to the dearth of pitching on the major league level. Talented pitchers are rushed through a ball club's farm system and aren't given the chance to pitch and to learn how to endure failure. Hall of Fame pitcher and former United States Senator Jim Bunning was quoted as saying, You will notice that if people have experience in failing in the minor leagues, they are more equipped to handle success and failure at the major league level. Nolan Ryan happens to agree with this opinion as he has changed the definition of a quality start with regards to the Texas Rangers. Instead of measuring a quality start by six innings and three or less earned runs, Ryan uses seven innings and three or less earned runs as his measurement. With the simple change of one inning, the elementary metric to measure a pitcher's minimum earned run average dropped from 4.5 to 3.86. If we were to compare Nolan Ryan's definition of a quality start to John Lowe's original concept and use Ryan's 27-year career as the subject, it would appear in the following manner. Even though the quality start statistic wasn't invented until 1985, BaseballReference.com has applied quality starts to the records of several pitchers whose careers preceded the introduction of this measurement of pitching. According to BaseballReference.com, Nolan Ryan had accumulated 481 quality starts in his career based on Lowe's definition of the statistic. However, if we were to use Ryan's definition, he would have only accumulated 399 quality starts. The 17.05% decline is significant when examining a span of 27 years. That equates to a yearly difference of 3.04 games between Lowe and Ryan's definitions of a quality start. In total, Ryan has started 773 games and threw a complete game 28.72% of the time. In 60.03% of the games that he had started, Ryan had pitched at least 7 innings. In 73.09% of the games that he had started, Ryan had given up 3 earned runs or less. This leads us to the end of Part 1 of a two-part series on quality starts in baseball, an in-depth look at redefining its relevance. Please join me for the second part, as I present various quantitative analyses, results, and even a recommendation for the creation of a new statistic.